Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jill Sutherland, and I am the Manitoba Liaison Officer with CADETH. I'm based in Winnipeg and would like to begin by acknowledging that this is located in Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So the opioid crisis has resulted in a need for alternative therapies and complementary multimodal care. In support of this, CAT has published an environmental scan in 2018 on access and availability of non-pharmacological interventions for chronic non-cancer pain. The report highlighted both gaps in access to non-pharmacological interventions for chronic pain, as well as limited guidance available to support clinicians and patients to make evidence-informed decisions when choosing an appropriate non-pharmacological intervention. Members of CADET's implementation support and knowledge mobilization team have been planning a series of webinars to help address this. In October, we hosted our first webinar on the science of mindfulness. I'm pleased today to introduce today's webinar topic as acupuncture for chronic non-cancer pain, and we're pleased to have three speakers who will be presenting. The first is Colleen Donder, who's a Knowledge Mobilization Officer at CADETH. Colleen will review the results of a recent CADETH Rapid Response Report that examined the current evidence on clinical effectiveness, cost-effectiveness, and evidence-based guidelines related to acupuncture for chronic pain. Colleen joined October, uh, CADETH in October of 2018. She graduated from Dalhousie University with a Bachelor of Pharmacy. Prior to joining CADETH, she completed a hospital pharmacy residency and worked as an academic detailer. And here in the room in Winnipeg with me is Dr. Greg Chernish, who received his doctorate of medicine from the University of Manitoba and studied acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine at the Chengdu College of Traditional Chinese Medicine in the People's Republic of China. He's an associate professor of family medicine at the University of Manitoba and is licensed to practice medicine in Manitoba and British Columbia. Dr. Chernish has extensive training in acupuncture and injection therapies and has been using acupuncture within a medical context for more than 25 years. He lectures nationally and internationally on the subjects of infertility, pain, disability, and the non-drug management of medical conditions. Also in the room with me is Cody Sharp. Cody currently works full-time as a firearms officer for the Canadian Firearms Program in Winnipeg. Her passion is coaching CrossFit part-time at undefeated performance, including running the children's program. She lives with his partner, her partner, his two teenage children, and two dogs. She was unofficially diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in December of 2019, after 11 months of inflammation and pain in her hands and feet. Her other interests include reading all of the books, learning all of the things, and becoming as healthy and pain-free as possible without the use of medications. So we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the chat box to type in your questions and we will respond to them following our three speakers. An evaluation survey will pop up on your screen following the session. We would greatly appreciate if you could take a few minutes to complete the survey. It helps us to plan for and improve upon future webinar offerings. And finally, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the CADETH website and on YouTube in the coming weeks so that others can view it later. Without further ado, I will invite Colleen Donder to begin. Thank you so much, Jill, for the kind introduction. And just to get us started, I just have a few disclosures to cover. Um, so CADETH is funded by the Federal, Provincial and Territorial Ministries of Health and also receives application fees through two different programs. I do not have any other conflicts of interest to disclose, uh, just that CADETH is providing an honorarium to Dr. Chernish and Cody for their time today. I do have a few acknowledgements. I would like to acknowledge the Acupuncture Webinar Planning Committee, the authors of the CADETH report, and then some other members at CADETH who have provided additional support as we have prepared for this webinar. For those of you who are not familiar with CADETH, CADETH is an independent non-for-profit organization, and essentially we help bring evidence to decision makers to help them make decisions on the optimal use of drugs and medical devices in their practice. Uh, and we deliver, uh, uh, CADETH has a bunch of different portfolios and can deliver um, a bunch of different services. Um, we have evidence and we have scientific advice and even recommendations from some of our larger projects such as our health technology assessments. For our learning objectives today, I'm going to be discussing the evidence from a CADETH report on acupuncture, and then I'll be passing it over to Dr. Chernish, who will also be discussing um, the evidence and some other clinical considerations from the clinician's perspective. And then lastly, we'll have Cody uh, sharing the patient's experience. 
And just before we uh, dive in, I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that if you go to kata.ca slash pain, you can find all of our evidence and our tools on pain management uh, located there. So Jill provided a great introduction when she started off this webinar, uh, but just to kind of remind everyone that nearly one in five Canadians have chronic pain. And historically, we have used medications such as opioids to, to treat pain, but we know due to our opioid crisis, um, and, we, and we also know that there are lots of side effects and harms from opioids. So we've been looking at other ways to help manage pain. And through that environmental scan, as Jill had mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, noticed that healthcare providers providers are wanting more guidance and interest on the non-pharmacological treatments. And so today we are going to be discussing acupuncture. And so I'll uh, be discussing a CADF report that was published on October 2019. Uh, the rapid response um, was a rapid response with critical appraisal. And the purpose of this type of report is to quickly identify, appra appraise, and summarize existing evidence on a specific health topic, which in this case is acupuncture. So I just want to make sure everyone's aware that this is a rapid review of the evidence. It is not a full systematic review. We're just looking at evidence that has been published within the past five years. Also at the end of uh, the webinar today, you will be emailed a two-page summary or, or link to a two-page summary um, that summarizes all the information for acupuncture that was found in the, the full 94-page report. So just to get us started, I have a quick definition here and Dr. Chernish will, will provide a more, a more thorough explanation of acupuncture uh, in his section, but just to kind of get us thinking, um, acupuncture is the process um, of inserting a thin acupuncture needle into an acupoint. And there are many different types of acupuncture and there are traditional and non-traditional types of acupuncture as well. And in this CADF report that I'm going to be discussing today, we reviewed kind of both those traditional and non-traditional ones. Um, so for example, there's electroacupuncture, manual acupuncture, dry needling, and warm needling. But we did consider, we did consider all types of acupuncture uh, for this report. For our research questions, we were looking at uh, what is the clinical effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of acupuncture for chronic non-cancer pain. And we also wanted to know what do the evidence-based guidelines say about acupuncture. And so we looked at any to adults with chronic pain. We did exclude pregnant individuals uh, and it was any type of pain. So it could be neck pain, back pain, or fibromyalgia pain, any type of pain. And as mentioned, the intervention could be any type of acupuncture, both traditional or non-traditional. And the comparator could be pharmacological interventions, sham therapy, placebo, wait list, or it could be usual care, but only if usual care was pharmacological therapy. Um, so we did not do any comparisons looking at acupuncture compared to other non-pharmacological interventions. And the most common comparator that we found was sham therapy. So what did Cadeth identify in the report? Uh, they found 23 systematic reviews. Uh, one of those systematic reviews did not pool any of the results together. 18 contained meta-analyses and four contained a network of meta-analyses. And when you look at the total number of randomized control trials within all of those 23 systematic reviews, there were 155 that were relevant to the questions that we were asking today. And they were published between 19 1975 to 2018. Um, and I just want to also reiterate that this was a limited literature search um, that was only looking at publications between January 1st, 2014, up until September 19th of 2019. So Kadath also identified one economic evaluation and due to time constraints today, I'm not gonna be diving into a lot of details, but I will quickly mention right now that it was um, a trial that was do, looking at electroacupuncture compared to uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory anti drugs and it was conducted in Iran. Unfortunately, there were no firm conclusions uh, at, that were being able to be drawn from this economic evaluation, uh, just due, not, due to the non, they didn't do the proper kind of calculations to make kind of a firm conclusion. And so we do need more economic evaluations, particularly in our Canadian context. 
Uh, and then lastly, we identified nine evidence-based guidelines. So just to kind of first start off, I have incorporated a couple kind of question and answers uh, throughout my presentation. So I have the first one here, that is uh, the acupuncture evidence reviewed by Cadith was of high quality, B, moderate quality, or C, low quality? And the answer is low quality. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the evidence limitations before we discuss what the findings were. So uh, overall, the systematic reviews that we included in this, in this rapid response were of high quality, but the issue lies within the primary studies that make up those systematic reviews. So the primary studies that were in those systematic reviews were of low quality. And so there are lots of gaps in the evidence and lots of biases in, in those primary studies. So when you combine all those low quality studies in a systematic review, you still have those same kind of gaps and biases within, uh, within the systematic review. So even though the, the systematic reviews were of high quality, it still is low quality evidence overall. Um, and so that's something to, to note that if we get additional high quality research, the chain, there could be changes uh, in the results that, that I'll be reporting later on today. Also, it's important to consider the generalizability to the Canadian context. So a lot of the studies were done in China where acupuncture has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And there's um, more uh, different expectations, preconceptions and familiarity with the intervention. So that's always something to think about when trying to apply to our Canadian population. And then uh, as, as I'm sure uh, all of you are aware, within kind of the pain evidence, there's a lot of kind of subjective reporting with different pain scales. And so some of the limitations that we have here or some of the scales that were used weren't always validated. Um, they were the all subjective in nature for the most part. And there were um, different scales and different um, outcomes that were reported in different trials. So then trying to combine all of those into a systematic review can make that difficult. Uh, we also, uh, for a lot of our paid evidence also, we don't know about long-term follow-up, which is also the case here for our acupuncture literature that was reviewed. And then lastly, um, while I'm reporting statistically significant differences, it's always important to consider what are the clinically important differences and uh, that wasn't really well described um, in, in the articles. Oh, and I do want to, sorry, just mention one last thing for any researchers on the line. Um, something to consider if you are going to be going down and doing some more primary studies on acupuncture uh, is to think about the STRICTA criteria, the standards for reporting interventions in clinical trials of acupuncture, because uh, when you're thinking about that criteria, it may help to develop some more robust, uh, remote, robust evidence. So moving on to my second question here, acupuncture may be effective for decreasing pain compared to sham therapy for which of the following pain conditions? So I have A, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, B, chronic headaches, C, chronic neck pain, D, chronic shoulder pain, E, sciatica, F, myofascial pain, G, hip osteoarthritis, H, knee osteoarthritis, I, osteoarthritis, and J, chronic back pain, and lastly, K, all of the above. And so the answer is all of the above. So acupuncture may be effective based on low quality evidence for all of those types of pain that were listed. And so I uh, have them all listed here again in this slide. And then I have uh, two other uh, columns here, one that represents the number of systematic reviews for each of the pain conditions, and it ranged from one to three. And then I have the number of relevant randomized control trials that look um, that are particular to our research questions. So comparing to sham therapy, for, for example. So there could have been more uh, randomized control trials in the systematic review, but we're just looking at the ones that were related to, to our research question. And so those numbers range from one um, all the way up to 13 for one systematic review or 15 over two systematic reviews. 
And so when we think about uh, these randomized control trials, um, it's important to note that there was a lot of heterogeneity um, within these trials. And so when um, we're saying that it may be effective, that's based off of a pooled estimate of all of those trials. Um, and so not every single trial showed a statistically significant benefit. There could have been um, ones that crossed the line of no difference, but when everything was summed up in the meta-analyses, it resulted in a pooled end result that was statistically significant. So that's something that's important to consider. And also just important to consider how many um, randomized control trials um, were included in the systematic reviews. As you can see, there was one that only had one randomized control trial. Um, so it's also important to kind of think about that when trying to apply this evidence. Um, so overall, uh, as mentioned, the low quality evidence suggests that acupuncture may be effective for these pain conditions um, and that may change as we get more uh, high quality literature uh, in the area. But right now with what we're working with, uh, that's what the evidence has reported. Um, and one pain condition that's not represented on this slide is uh, fibromyalgia pain. And fibromyalgia pain actually came back with uh, conflicting results in that we identified two systematic reviews, one that showed a benefit and one that showed no statistically significant difference. Um, so I just thought I would mention that here. So there are, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we did look at all other types of acupuncture as well. And we also look at, looked at acupuncture compared to pharmacological interventions. But uh, just since I do not have enough time today to kind of walk through all of that evidence, I do encourage you to take a look at the two page in brief where this information is all summarized so you can get a better sense of how acupuncture compared to other interventions or other specific types of acupuncture, how, how they fared for certain uh, medical conditions. Uh, medical pain conditions, that is. And so uh, the results were a bit more variable. Um, so I do encourage you to take a look there. And so my last question uh, that I have is related to guidelines. So it's a true or false question. All identified guidelines recommended the use of acupuncture for various pain conditions, true or false? And the answer is false. And so um, guidelines can be kind of described as a piece of advice or a principle. Um, sometimes even people consider them to be kind of general rules. Um, and guidelines, they have different methodologies and they, there are different quality to guidelines. We were looking at evidence-based guidelines. Um, and the quality of the evidence that, that the guidelines identify can vary. And so even, guidelines that are on the same for the same pain condition, the way the authors interpret that evidence can lead to different recommendations being made for different pain conditions. Um, so the, the guidelines that were reviewed uh, for our reports, um, they did look at the quality of the evidence and they made strength of recommendations, um, but they were all based off kind of different systems. Um, so sometimes they were using the, the grade system to, to rate the strength of the recommendations, or sometimes it was an internal ranking system um, that they had for their own guidelines. So it's always important to kind of think about how they came to those conclusions and what evidence they reviewed and identified um, and how they interpreted that. And so overall, there were six evidence-based guidelines that provided recommendations, and they were all of varying strengths, um, ranging from very low all the way up to moderate, um, recommending the use of acupuncture for different pain conditions. And those pain conditions included chronic low back pain, different types of arthritis, like knee arthritis, and then lots of other pain disorders, ranging from like scrotal pain all the way up to, to headache pain. There were two guidelines identified that did not provide recommendations for acupuncture. One was in patients with low back pain and one was in patients with spinal cord related neuropathic injuries, and that was due to insufficient evidence. And the guidelines identified one guideline recommended um, against acupuncture for over simulated acupuncture for neck pain uh, due, to in, due to evidence of no effectiveness. And lastly, one guideline recommended dry needling in the short term for the relief of myofacial pain. 
So I do apologize for this next slide. There is a lot of text, uh, but just to summarize everything I just quickly ran over um, is that there, uh, we do need more high quality research on the clinical effectiveness of acupuncture. Overall, the low quality evidence that was reviewed suggests that acupuncture may be effective at for decreasing pain for people living with chronic pain. Um, but there are some inconsistencies and does depend on the patient population and the type of acupuncture. And if we get more research, um, that could uh, change these findings. And uh, lastly, the majority but not all guidelines recommend the use of acupuncture for various pain conditions. Um, and those strengths were varied uh, depending on the quality of the evidence and the type of acupuncture and patient population that was evaluated. And for example, the chronic low back pain, they, there were inconsistent um, findings. And so before I pass things over to Dr. Turnish, um, uh, just wanted to let everyone know that we do hope to continue the webinar series um, in the fall. And we also will be uh, putting together hopefully some patient handouts on how to manage your chronic pain without medicine. Um, and those we also hope to launch in the fall as well. So thank you so much uh, everyone for listening and I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Turnish. Thanks very much, Colleen, and, and thank you so much for having me speak here. I would just like to clarify that I wasn't involved in the in the review uh, that CADA did, uh, but I'm going to speak to some of the issues regarding acupuncture and to uh, clarify um, uh, what acupuncture's role might be in uh, chronic pain. And basically, based on low-quality evidence, what's the point, if you'll uh, excuse the pun? Um, so I studied at the Chengdu College of Traditional Chinese Medicine 1989 to 1990, and I studied acupuncture and herbal medicine there. And I've been practicing uh, acupuncture in a medical context, um, full-time my clinical practice for almost 30 years now. And in uh, reviewing the issues about the uh, We're stuck on our slides here. There we go. <clears throat> Apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay, here we go. Uh, so on the weekend, I was um, I'm browsing CNN online uh, about the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I came upon an article that discussed the use of acupuncture in Chinese herbal medicine manage, managing COVID-19. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, the president of China, Xi Jinping, uh, has uh, been a strong advocate of uh, Chinese medicine treating um, in combining with medicine for treating conditions. And uh, he's encouraged uh, doctors in China to combine Chinese medicine with regular Western medicine. And it's uh, interesting that this is uh, the CNN slant has been to uh, point out the polarization between those who are advocating for a science first based approach, which would be to do randomized trials uh, before uh, using treatments and the traditional practitioners who realize that uh, randomized trials are very difficult to do with treatments that are individualized for each patients. And then uh, President Ping, 
uh, advocating more of a middle road, which is to use something that seems to be cost effective and low risk for uh, a situation where there is a high risk of the disease, but also limited uh, treatments. And I think that's uh, uh, similar to where uh, we've been at uh, with chronic pain for uh, some time. So just to give some background then uh, on where, uh, why non-drug treatments are important than treatment of chronic pain. Many uh, guidelines uh, support non-drug interventions as first-line treatment for uh, chronic pain, including the Centers for Disease Control in the United States and the National Opioid Use Guidelines in Canada. But also many guidelines recommend uh, non-drug treatments, including acupuncture as first-line uh, therapy for acute pain. Uh, and this is due mainly to the risk of medications, but not just opioids, but also uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs as they're called, uh, which also have significant mortality. And acupuncture is always mentioned within uh, the, the group of non-drug treatments, uh, but the science is difficult to interpret and the science always comes out as low quality evidence. Evidence. And I think I would like to clarify what low quality evidence uh, means in terms of acupuncture as we go along so that if you'll pardon the expression, we don't throw out the high quality baby with the low quality bath water. And so we'll start with definitions. I think that's really important in any discussion of non-drug treatments and particularly acupuncture. So chronic pain is pain that persists for uh, more than three months, but it's not just pain that is uh, three months plus a day. It's a different animal than uh, acute pain. And so chronic pain is not an extension of, uh, linear extension of acute pain, but it's a much more complex biopsychosocial phenomenon, phenomenon that develops over time. And it has the pre-existing characteristics and personalities, emotional aspects, psychological aspects, but also social aspects. And it's not treated at all the same uh, as chronic pain. And it's estimated that 20, of Americans have chronic pain at any one time. And it's interesting to know that pain is the number one reason that people visit their doctors worldwide, and back pain is the number one type of pain that people see their doctors for. But when we talk about chronic pain, we have to talk about uh, comorbidities, and that means uh, what kind of medical conditions occur along with the pain. And it's very common for physical and psychological comorbidities to exist in the chronic pain patients. In fact, depression is a very common uh, comorbidity occurring in up to 50% to much higher uh, percentages in uh, certain pain populations. And also, uh, very interesting to note that most patients uh, with depression pre present their primary care practitioner not with depression symptoms or mood symptoms, but with pain symptoms. So. We know that chronic pain is frequently comorbid with depression, and at six months of chronic pain, uh, people will have four times uh, the normal uh, incidence of depression. But until recently, the, the treatment has been uh, more to treat that with opioids, and opioids have been more highly prescribed in uh, patients with chronic pain and comorbid depression uh, rather than antidepressants. So, this leads us to the, the big problem, which is uh, overdose with opioid analgesics. And in the last decade, drug overdose uh, has been the number one cause of accidental death for most of, most of those years. Now, uh, overdose is usually by narcotics, and prescription narcotics have been directly or indirectly the number one uh, cause of those uh, narcotics overdoses. And so that's surpassed uh, traffic accidents. Another way uh, and more frightening way to look at things is that uh, life expectancy in the US has decreased over the period 2014 to 2017, primarily or mainly due to opioid related uh, mortality. And then uh, when we look uh, further at the uh, comorbidities with uh, chronic pain, we know that uh, a completed suicide risk is two to three times for chronic pain patients versus the general population. And that most patients uh, complete suicide with medications, often ones they've been prescribed 
for chronic pain. So it's a, it's a massive problem, and it's, chronic pain is a complex situation which is going to be no magic bullet since it is by definition a multifactorial biopsychosocial problem. So current medical approach until very recently has been to rely heavily on dangerous uh, treatments, uh, mainly medications. And I think what we're seeing now is the beginning of a cultural shift to a multimodal safety first approach, which I'm going to talk about. So it's interesting, uh, but when we, when we uh, talk about acupuncture, there's not a universal definition of what acupuncture is. And uh, I, uh, as part of my preparation for this talk, I uh, contacted a group called the Society for Acupuncture Research, asked them what their definition of acupuncture was. And I got a nice reply, which said, you know, it's interesting. Nobody's ever asked us that question in the 10 years I've been here. And so I think, this is the beginning of where we're going to try to understand how is it that we always end up with this uh, term low quality evidence with acupuncture. Well, the first reason I think is that we don't have a standard definition of acupuncture. And so when we search for acupuncture studies, uh, the intervention is never clearly defined. And so we have things uh, uh, pulled together that most people wouldn't agree uh, is acupuncture and that even don't have any uh, relationship to one another. So for instance, bee venom acupuncture would be one, uh, which is included in uh, some reviews. And so that would be stinging uh, uh, poor painful patients with a live bee or injecting uh, uh, bee venom with a hypodermic needle, uh, something called fire needling, which would be uh, heating up uh, again for the poor pain patient, an acupuncture needle with a blowtorch and uh, inserting the, the red hot needle into the patient's body, dry needling, which we'll talk about uh, in a second, and scalp acupuncture, which would be um, treating the rest of the body with a scalp, which can be somewhat painful. And uh, it goes on and on, but, but also includes embedded catgut acupuncture in some reviews, which would be surgical implantation of a dissolvable suture. Uh, so, most people who do acupuncture would see those all those treatments as um, maybe not being part of what a generally agreed uh, concept of acupuncture is. Uh, so we have to clarify this. Furthermore, uh, we have to clarify what an acupuncture point was if, if we use that term. And I think an acupuncture point has also never been clearly or uni clearly defined or universally accepted. So let's start with an acupuncturist definition of acupuncture. So uh, I have uh, developed one for this uh, talk and I think uh, the, I've included some of the salient features for what constitutes acupuncture. And the first of which is it's a healthcare treatment using a thin, flexible, solid needle, not a hypodermic needle, and certain to the body at symptomatic points, but also points distant from symptoms. And I think that's particularly unique for acupuncture and is part of how we define acupuncture. If we have a sore knee, we also can have uh, points put in the foot or the arm or the back sometimes, and that the needles are retained in the body for a period of time. They're not just put in and out. And I think when we define acupuncture in this way, uh, we can get a more better picture of uh, whether acupuncture might be effective. And if I were designing a study or a review of studies, I wouldn't include dry needling in uh, the, uh, under the umbrella of acupuncture. And that's for uh, several reasons. One is in the medical community in Winnipeg, at least, uh, hypodermic needles are often used for dry needling. Uh, and that's not, uh, doesn't bear any relation to acupuncture. And uh, basically it's the use of a, hypodermic needle or an acupuncture needle to uh, manually stimulate tight muscles. But it's done at symptomatic uh, needles, at symptomatic areas only, and the needles aren't retained in dry needling. Uh, but also side effects are uh, much more common with dry needling, particularly bruising and pain. And uh, pneumothorax in my analysis is more common with dry needling than with uh, acupuncture. So an acupuncture treatment might look something like this. And when we have uh, uh, needles that are uh, in the skin and, uh, um, and uh, when they're in the skin and uh, retained like that, we see that something is happening. In this case, we have what's called a histamine response. And so let's talk a 
briefly about the physiology. So the physiology of acupuncture would uh, um, uh, include both local effects and whole body effects. And I think that's important to understand. Um, the local effects are um, mediated in part by what's called the current of injury, which is an electrical, uh, electrical uh, uh, activity in the area where the needle is inserted. And uh, along with that comes an increase in blood flow and uh, So, an increase in blood flow and uh, and immune cells. Um, forward one. Uh, that's okay. Uh, this slide advances itself, but uh, so there's a local effect, but there's also whole body effects, and those whole body effects are mediated in part by uh, hormones. Uh, some of them are uh, pain uh, killing hormones, if you will, which would be endogenous opioids, but also um, anti-inflammatory hormones like cortisols, and also uh, uh, hormones with effects on moods, and, uh, and, uh, and also sex hormones. And it's also important to note that, that acupuncture has effects on the nervous system, uh, the autonomic nervous system, which um, basically the unconscious nervous system, but also what are called descending pain inhibitory pathways in the uh, brain and spinal cord. So, So let's talk um, briefly then about um, the practice of acupuncture. It's important to know what acupuncture is about. And a course of acupuncture is going to be not just a single treatment, but likely a course of several treatments, depending on the practitioner, the patient, the condition that will be conducted over uh, uh, days or weeks or months. And really important to understand that the treatments are individualized to each patient's uh, symptoms and constitution. And then the treatments are going to vary from visit to visit based on symptoms. And also that there's a dose of acupuncture. So for instance, electroactive puncture was uh, uh, mentioned earlier, and there are different types of stimulating uh, acupuncture needles that will affect the dose. So uh, there's electrical stimulation and manual stimulation of the needles. The dose will depend also on the number of needles, the depth of which you put the needles in, um, the, the way we combine uh, locations of acupuncture needles. So it's a very difficult thing to standardize. But perhaps uh, one important thing also to mention is that acupuncture persists over time, which is gonna be important when we talk about our next slide, which is about placebos. So placebos are one of the issues that make acupuncture research uh, very difficult. And while acupuncture pers uh, effects persist over time, generally uh, placebos, for medications anyway, don't tend uh, to persist over time. And when we compare an acupuncture placebo to a pharmaceutical placebo, uh, there are some important differences. One is it's impossible to blind the acupuncture practitioner to what he's doing. And the second is that it's uh, difficult uh, to blind the patient whether uh, he's receiving acupuncture or not, he or she. But the, the third point is that acupuncture placebos are often active placebos. That means they're going to have a higher response, placebo response, than uh, medication type placebos. And that's uh, basically because in many acupuncture studies, the sham has been uh, penetrating uh, a penetrating needle done at a point that might not usually be considered for that condition or shallow needling at a point that is usually considered for, for that um, condition. The issue becomes when a needle inserted anywhere in the body has a whole body effect, is that that's not uh, a true placebo. It's an active placebo that has, uh, has physiological effects in the body. And even when we use a non-penetrating needle uh, for uh, acupuncture placebo, we touch the patient, we put pressure on, on spots that have some physiological effect. This makes a uh, study of acupuncture difficult. And if we look at the effects of different uh, placebos, uh, we can see that sham acupuncture placebo has uh, a higher um, placebo uh, effect than uh, usual conventional uh, placebos, but also in some cases than conventional therapy. In fact, 
There's one very large study of acupuncture for back pain in 2006 done in Germany, where the uh, acupuncture and the sham acupuncture um, placebos uh, produced um, higher rates of response than conventional therapy, much higher actually, which was uh, physiotherapy and anti-inflammatories. So it's important to, th to think about that whole body effect of acupuncture and really what was the placebo used in the studies that were uh, done. Uh, so to summarize, it's difficult to draw conclusions from acupuncture uh, existing trials because often the acupuncture intervention isn't clearly or consistently defined and the treatments aren't standardized and from a, uh, from a traditional Chinese medicine point of view, uh, it wouldn't really be uh, acupuncture if we standardize things. And also that there's the issue of active placebos. However, it is possible in some ways to do, develop strong recommendations from low quality trials if, for instance, the benefits clearly outweigh the risks of the bur and burdens. And this is the way the American College of Physicians does it. And the American College of Physicians is the internal medicine uh, uh, group in the United States, the national group, who have their own grading system for evidence. And their, uh, their uh, guideline for clinical practice guideline for non-invasive invasive treatment of acute, subacute, and chronic back pain uh, made the recommendation that for initial non-pharmacological management, including acupuncture for both acute and chronic back pain, despite low quality evidence for acute back pain and moderate quality evidence for chronic back pain. I think that's a safety first approach. So just uh, quickly moving on to uh, clinical considerations, we think of acupuncture as a safe intervention uh, with uh, really uh, be unusual to have infections or fatalities. We would occasionally have a, a pneumothorax as a puncture of the lung and sometimes bruising or uh, pain afterwards, but generally safe uh, procedure is not going to um, harm anyone. Also, clinical trials would be difficult. Uh, there's no legislative act, for instance, or self-governing body in Manitoba, and the costs would be similar to massage or physiotherapy. Uh, so in areas like Manitoba, really anybody can do acupuncture and um, call themselves an acupuncture, which is a, an issue for our consumers. So just uh, briefly to uh, just uh, briefly to look over a couple of slides of ac people getting acupuncture treatments. One would be erythromyalgia, which is a vascular pain condition. The other would be a chronic abdominal pain, uh, which is uh, 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 a common uh, problem. And I think just to summarize in our uh, my talk. I think moving forward, we should uh, be clear about what we mean by lack of evidence because we should qualify that. Uh, because sometimes uh, we, we, what we mean is uh, lack of trials. And low quality also has to be qualified with due to, uh, especially uh, mentioning uh, subject active placebos. But also we have to be careful about what we define. For instance, if uh, we're, we're reviewing myofascial pain, I think myofascial pain is a condition with no universally accepted criteria, uh, no unif uh, universally accepted uh, definition. And so then in that situation, we can get it, uh, try to develop a recommendation of a treatment which is not clearly defined for a condition which is not clearly defined and that's problematic. So I think what we have to be careful is we don't uh, consider that lack of evidence proves that acupuncture is less effective. Uh, than other treatments, because this misconception is going to push us towards more drug uh, treatments and more of the same problem. So from my point of view, acupuncture has a strong role to play in a safe and effective treatment and a multimodal approach to treatment of chronic pain, despite the inherent difficulties in studying it. And we should consider expert ac acupuncture input as a valuable component for design of acupuncture studies and for analysis. Since the accepted standard for management of chronic pain is multimodal, I think studies of package of care, including acupuncture, might offer more uh, real-world applicability than acupuncture must trials.
So now I'm going to introduce uh, one of my patients, Cody, who I chose to give uh, her story because uh, she's uh, uh, well-read and well-interested and uh, has an interesting uh, trouble, um, uh, which uh, had an interesting acupuncture response, but also demonstrates the importance of searching for comorbidities. And Cody came to me for treatment of uh, what she was uh, diagnosed with was osteoarthritis of the hands, of the wrists, and uh, despite seeing many uh, therapists and uh, practitioners and doctors, and uh, Cody's going to tell her story. Hello, Cody. Hello. Hello everyone. So like Dr. Chernish said, I went through a bit of a process to sort of figure out what was happening with my body. Um, Bill already gave a great introduction. This isn't news for any of you here. So basically my pain started in May of 2018. I had some pain in my foot um, diagnosed with the Morton's neuroma, which I believe that was, but I believe it was sort of the beginning of a bigger issue. So last January, I woke up with a swollen right wrist and hand, um, no apparent reason. The only thing that I could think of was I had sprained my wrist a couple years earlier and thought maybe I had injured it again. Led me to an acute injury clinic doctor. We had x-rays done um, and then also an MRI, which were done very close together. And I was diagnosed at that time with osteoarthritis and I also have a tear in my TFCC on my right hand. So in reviewing the MRI, the doctor at that time told me that I should take some leave to take the edge off, but basically I just have to deal with the arthritis pain for the rest of my life. Uh, and being that I was 36 years old at the time, I wasn't super interested in taking a leave for the next hopefully 50 years of my life, which led me to some, you could call it like an N equals one experiment on my own pain situation. Uh, so I went through some different, tre different treatments like Dr. Turner had said. I started with some prolotherapy injections. Um, then a few months later, my left hand was starting to be affected. So again, I got some prolotherapy injections. I started physiotherapy and there I was exposed to both ultrasound and acupuncture treatments. Um, and that time the acupuncture treatments seemed to be really helping with the inflammation and swelling in my hands. Um, moving further along, my right foot swelled up and then come November of this past year, both my hands and feet were swollen, which brought me to Dr. Chernish. Uh, to give you sort of an idea for those of you who haven't experienced sort of inflammatory pain that goes with rheumatoid arthritis is I had a lot of trouble sleeping. So I'd wake up in pain, my hands would be really swollen and Hard to describe, but it's a sharp ache sort of everywhere. Uh, so I couldn't go back to sleep. Um, any touch or brush to my hands would cause waves of pain. There were a couple of times I almost like fell over because I'd brushed the, my car door the wrong way and it was very painful. Um, I struggled with buckling my seatbelt. Once my feet were swollen, I was limping all the time. Um, I had no grip strength. So things like opening jars or playing with my dog were pretty impossible. Um, but I also had to figure out what I could wear each day based on how my hands were feeling. So there are days where I wouldn't be able to wear jeans or dress pants, as an example, because I wouldn't be able to button them up or pull them on. Um, and as Jill said, I coach CrossFit. And so I was struggling to participate doing CrossFit as well as with coaching. I made it work. Um, I'll talk about it in a moment by modifying. And then also sort of in that is there are significant feelings of uselessness, which kind of goes back to what Dr. Turnish was saying about depression. Um, my partner and I bought a house and moved in that time and it was really difficult for me to not be helpful. So other things that I've tried besides the acupuncture um, and currently am trying, um, I've made significant changes to my diet and following the autoimmune protocol uh, to help with the rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. Um, 
I'm still crossfitting. I crossfit three, two to three times a week instead of three to five times a week like I was in the past. Um, and then I'm also modifying fewer movements now that the swelling's gone away, but I still am doing different workouts than most of the people at my gym. Working really hard on sleep management with meditation um, and then stress management as well, trying to um, really incorporate doing, quote unquote, doing nothing into my life. So again, here's a list of the things that I tried for the physical side of the pain management. Um, I wasn't super keen on doing the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so I did them only when I really had to and couldn't function, but other than that, I stayed away. And then um, I'd say that the most help I've had physically for pain would be with acupuncture. Um, so I started in December 2019, and at this time, Dr. Chernish unofficially diagnosed me with rheumatoid arthritis, as well as some generalized joint hypermobility. Um, the reason why I say unofficially is I have yet to see a rheumatologist. Um, I come every two weeks, and he sticks the needles in me, and then at the end of the day, my hands and feet feel significantly better, um, better range of motion, and the swelling subsides if there is any at all. Oh, yeah, so here we go. So I've been coming here, like I said, since December of 2019. Um, I came in with like pretty good swelling of the feet and hands. And as of today, I just have one swollen finger. Um, my feet are no longer swollen. I don't have pain walking or putting on shoes. And the occasional times that I had some pain in my knees or elbows is now has now dissipated. And here we go. Uh, Best pain levels is now a zero to two. So um, very little stiffness in the morning, no pain putting on clothing, playing with my dog. I can continue CrossFit. And actually I've been amping it up a little bit in the recent weeks because I have been feeling so good. Uh, no issues with grip strength anymore. And I'm sleeping through the night. And luckily I've regained some independence, which makes me much happier. And I can guarantee you much easier to live with. And that's it for me. So that's great. Thank you to all of our presenters. I see that we have a number of questions in the chat box. So I'm going to start uh, with this one and I'm gonna direct this to you, Dr. Chernish. And the question is from an anonymous attendee wondering if acupuncture can be used for rotator cuff tears. Well, acupuncture is not, I've treated many patients with rotator cuff tears who uh, were waiting for surgery or couldn't have surgery for some reason. And acupuncture obviously is not going to fix the rotator cuff tear, but it definitely will provide uh, significant and can provide long-term uh, uh, pain relief with rotator cuff tear. And I've had many patients over the years who I would treat for um, several treatments, and then they would come back six months or a year later uh, for uh, top-up. Great. Thank you. A second question, and I think this one could be directed to both Dr. Chernich and then Cody, you may want to weigh in on this from a patient perspective. So the question is from Chitra Jacob, and she's wondering, when acupuncture is used concurrently with other interventions, how can we assess the impact of acupuncture on the outcome? If we're thinking about that multimodality treatment approach. Sure, Cody is ready to, to answer. So again, this is just my N equals one experience. Um, but from what, how I think acupuncture works for me is it's allowing me the time to be pain free to try out these other modalities. So waking up in pain every day and being unable to function, you're going to go to the treatment that allows you to be the most pain free the quickest. Whereas with acupuncture, it allows me, you know, a couple weeks of inflammation free. So it's allowing me to. Um, be more diligent about my sleep management, my stress management, as well as my diet. So instead of taking that ibuprofen every day, um, I can manage it with manage it with acupuncture. So I'll just repeat the question for Dr. Chernish to weigh in. When acupuncture is used concurrently with other interventions, how can we assess the impact of acupuncture on the outcome? You mean in designing? Uh, if you mean in designing? Trials, uh, well, I, I suggest that this might be the best way for any uh, evaluation of a treatment for chronic pain since uh, we're not 
nobody expects uh, a magic bullet, as I mentioned, for chronic pain. It's a not the accepted way of treating things. Uh, so uh, if we were to study a package of care, which might include acupuncture, that would probably be the best way and the best way of studying acupuncture for chronic pain, but also uh, perhaps uh, for most likely other therapies as well. Excellent. And keep you on the hot spot, Dr. Schmidt. This question is also directed to you. In your opinion, would acupuncture combined with spinal manipulation provide additional benefit when compared to either treatment delivered in isolation for spine, neck, or low back pain? Mm, hard, to, hard to say, you know, hard to say, but uh, I, don't, um, I don't have a comment on that one. And the question just above, uh, wondering if you might comment on the neurophysiology of acupuncture with respect to endorphins. Okay, so this is a very, it's a very short trial, and we had some technical difficulties with my slides for some reason, but not with Cody's. But I did briefly mention endogenous uh, opioids. Uh, we got stuck on that slide, and so that's definitely one of the ways that that acupuncture works is through neurohormonal uh, mechanisms within the body. And so uh, part of the way that, that acupuncture works is by the release of endogenous op opioids, which are a natural morphines in the brain and spinal cord, but also other hormones, including serotonin and norepinephrine, norepinephrine being particularly effective with pain and also effects on the descending pain inhibitory pathways or the body's natural pain blocking pathways, which go from the brain to the spinal cord. One more question here, Dr. Chernish, they're all coming in for you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find good quality practitioners for referring patients? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think that, um, like everything, you know, like it's, it's got to be a, it has to be a multimodal uh, assessment. I mean, you can uh, um, Google reviews and rate MDs aren't necessarily going to be your best uh, bet. Neither are um, neither neither is the internet necessarily. And so I think uh, uh, thinking about it carefully, uh, word of mouth. Uh, whether uh, the practitioner uh, is a member of a self-regulated uh, profession is really important uh, for looking at safety. Um, uh, th those would be uh, uh, the kind of things I'd look at. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Ning Chow is a member of the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture, uh, which I used to be uh, a member of. And uh, I think there's some, some value for it in treating uh, acute pain in the battlefield. Uh, I'm not up to date on the studies, but uh, I think it definitely, uh, it probably has a role, uh, even if a small role to play. Thank you very much. It looks like we do not have any further questions. And as we are at the end of our time, I would like to again thank our three speakers for sharing their knowledge and insight with us. And thank you all very much for joining the webinar. Please do subscribe to Cadith Alerts on the Cadith website to receive notices about new projects and upcoming events. Take care, everyone.